Let's take our Bibles tonight. Open up with me, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and then we're going to move into chapter 9 tonight, so keep your marker here. Tonight we continue in this study of 2 Corinthians entitled Sufficient Grace, and tonight as we look at this message, we are dealing once again with a topic that uh, has always made me a bit uncomfortable, and it's the topic of giving. My discomfort about this topic comes from the perception that is cast by uh, so many ministries and ministers all across this nation, and that the moment that you start talking about this subject, it really just rankles some people, really gets them upset. Uh, so I, I move into this topic, I've always moved into this topic with a little bit of fear and intrepidation, uh, and also because it's one of those topics that I've never really felt this is a church that needed this topic. You know, there are some churches that probably do, uh, but never has this church been the church that needs the topic. So I guess that's a good thing that you can preach it without saying, hey, you need this, are you paying attention kind of thing. But it's a good encouragement for us to continue doing what the Lord has blessed us and taught us to do through the years. Normally I begin with some sort of a story to set up the message. Tonight it's a little bit different just because of the seriousness of the topic. The topic is the grace to have financial integrity. The grace to have financial integrity. So I set the message up like this. Uh, many churches, many ministries, many pastors have gone down the tubes because they have lacked integrity in this particular area, the area of financial giving. Misappropriation of funds, embezzlement seems to be the top crimes that are committed uh, by those ministries. And it's just it's an ugly, it's an embarrassing thing when it comes out uh, that a ministry or a minister or an organization has done that. I want to share with you kind of the basis of uh, the basics of our methods that we have here to protect the integrity of the giving. The offerings, uh, the offering box used to be the offering plates. Uh, when those offerings are given and uh, at the middle part of the service, our ushers, plural. Our ushers take that into the office and they begin to count and they make a record of what has been given, the checks, the cash, things like that. And I say plural because it's not just one that goes in and does it, it is a plurality of individuals that go in. Once the service is over, then our uh, beloved and esteemed financial secretary and her assistants they go into the office, and they count it again, and they compare their figures with the figures of the ushers, and if there is any kind of questions or anything else, it can be solved. Designated giving, if you give money and you designate it for a particular place, 100% of the designated funds goes exactly to where it was designated for. There is not a portion of it that goes, and then another portion goes elsewhere. 100% goes where it was designated. One person writes checks, another signs the checks. The writer of the checks cannot sign the checks. The few individuals who know who gives what, and there are obviously individuals that who knows who gives what. If a person gives by check, obviously you're going to know if you're counting it, you're recording it, you're going to know. Those few individuals who know who gives what have got the tightest lips around. You will never get out of their mouths who gave what. That has, to my knowledge, that has never, ever been something that has been shared. That's how tight-lipped they are. As a pastor, I know absolutely nothing about anybody's giving. I believe with all of my heart it is no pastor's business to know what the people are giving. And if a pastor does know what the people are giving, he has put himself into a compromised position, and he knows something that is none of his business. I, I mean that 100% without apology. Twice a year, our books are turned over to Penrod and George. Penrod and George is not a, I don't know the people that work there, but it's not a Christian company. There may, I'm, I'm hoping there's Christians that work there, but it's not a Christian company. Therefore, they have got nothing to gain if they cook our books for us or, or fudge things to make things look right or whatever. They look at the books. They do not turn a blind eye to anything, and uh, they make sure that everything is right and of course we get that report back and it's right why because we got good people doing good work and doing it carefully and doing it with integrity 
There is a report that is given to the church twice a year. You have the bottom line figures for all those different accounts. If you have any questions, you are free to ask those questions. You will get answers to those questions. When I say that you're free to ask the questions, you're like, great, well, I, go, I don't get an answer, though. Yeah, you will. Maybe not in the business meeting, but if you have any questions, there's a financial secretary, there's our clerk, you can go talk to them, they will show you the information that you need. Not who gives what, that's none of your business either, amen? But they will show you and they will explain to you those bottom lines, how we get those bottom lines. In the event that our church was to dissolve, 0% of the assets go to any member, go to myself, to any contributor. 100%, it's right in the Constitution, 100% of the assets from the dissolution of this church will go to the missionaries that this church supports, all right? That's where our finances are at. It takes a lot of grace to put such integrity into place, trying to imagine anything that could possibly go wrong and heading it off, putting up a safeguard before that would ever happen. That's what the Apostle Paul is dealing with. You say, why are we getting into that? Because that's what the Apostle Paul is dealing with. The Bible addresses, I believe, the Bible addresses everything that we ever need to know in life. If the Bible doesn't address it, then we don't need to know about it. The Bible gives us the principles that can be applied to absolutely everything that we deal with in life. And this area of financial integrity is something that the Bible addresses very specifically. So in your Bibles tonight, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we left off in verse 15 last week. Tonight, starting in verse 16, Paul says, But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. For indeed he accepted the exhortation, but being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us by this grace, which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord and declaration of your ready mind, avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us, providing for honest things not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. Last week we we left off, we were talking about the giving that had been uh, presented or or the need had been presented to the churches of Macedonia, including Corinth, for the needs of the churches back in Jerusalem. Now, if you pull up a Bible map, there is quite a distance between the two locations. And to get the money from point A to point B, you know, back then they just didn't have transfer of funds. They didn't have the wire transfer. So how are you going to get the money from point A to point B? You're going to take it. And so Paul is establishing a type of integrity here that will assure all the givers that every ounce of the gift given is going to go the way that it is supposed to go and to the people to whom it is supposed to go. So tonight, integrity protects the gifts. If you're keeping notes, the very first point tonight is that integrity protects the gifts. We can pull several points out of these verses. We're only going to pull three. The three points are this. How does integrity protect the gifts? First of all, accountability. Accountability. Again, in verse 21, providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. You go trying to hide something and you're no longer accountable. When you keep things out in the open, above board, where everybody can see it. We have heard so much in politics about transparency. Does anybody believe that politics are transparent? Not in the least. So therefore, we have a lot of skepticism when it comes to politics. We've got a lot of negative feelings because that transparency has failed time and time and time again. And I don't care who it is that's in the White House. There is not transparency. When it comes within the church, it comes to our giving, and it comes to the handling of the funds, it comes to our Christian life. There has got to be transparency. There's got to be accountability. Financial gifts were going to be given and transported to Jerusalem. How easy would it have been? Now, Paul and Titus, I'm guessing were honest guys, right? I mean, do you think they were probably honest? And nobody is going to accuse Paul and Titus of stealing, of embezzling, of you know, saying one for you, one for me, two for you, two for me. Nobody's going to accuse them of that. They can be trusted, right? Here's something that you got to understand. Accountability has nothing to do with trust. 
You know, a lot of times when you put those measures of accountability in place, somebody says, well, you don't trust me. You know what? If a person wasn't trusted, they wouldn't be in that position. Every single one of the people that handles the money within this church, and that would also include our department heads that have the control over a budget. You know why they're put in that place? Because they're trusted. We don't hold them accountable because they're not trustworthy or not trusted. You hold people accountable because it has to do with integrity. It has to do with everything being done in the sight of everyone. Turn in your Bibles. Keep your marker here. Go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, verse 17. The Bible says in verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of what? All men. Let's move back to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. And here the Bible says, having your conversation, your lifestyle honest among the Gentiles. That whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. How many Gentiles, how many unsaved individuals want nothing to do with church, want nothing to do with Christian ministries, want nothing to do with with the giving into those ministries, because there have been so many individuals that have not been accountable and they've been caught with their hands in the cookie jar. And so they, the lost people, they look at it and they write all the Christians off because of one individual or one particular ministry, and so all suffer for it. We are supposed to do things above board in the sight of all men. There is nothing that, that is to be kept from people. It is to be out there in the open. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, abstain from all appearance of evil. That has to do with accountability. On all of our school buses, we have got cameras. And I remember when the cameras first started coming on the buses. I guess maybe years ago they had cameras, then they took all the cameras off. Now all the cameras are back on the bus. But it's a, you know, these are really fancy ones now. They pick up audio, they pick it all up. It's great. And there was a few drivers that when they started putting the cameras in the buses, they didn't like it. Because of the very thing, they don't trust me. And I told them, I says, it has nothing to do with trust. It has to do with the fact that on that school bus, there is only one person on my side. That's the camera. That's it. Oh, them kids, they'd stick together thicker than thieves. You could talk to them. You saw that happen, didn't you? Yeah. And then it's everybody's on the bandwagon. Yeah, I saw it too. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Brrr, and you're hung. You would be surprised how many times that a parent has been brought in. And has been told, this is what your child did. My child would never do that. Let's pop a bag of popcorn and watch the movie. The camera don't lie. It's the only thing on your side. It's accountability. It has nothing to do with trust. Integrity protects the gift. Let's look at the next thing. Go back to uh, 2 Corinthians 8. Look at verse 18. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 18. He says, and we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. Again, then in verse, uh, let's look at verse 22. And we have sent with them our brother. This is another one whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things. But now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. Not only is there accountability, but there is anonymity. Anonymity. Titus and Paul have been mentioned, obviously. But there's two others who are not mentioned by name. All we know is that they are individuals who have served, and they have served well. Is it necessary that their names be mentioned? If you would, turn back in your Bibles to John's Gospel, chapter 6. John's Gospel, chapter 6, records a story that is missing a detail. John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 5. The Bible says, when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, when shall we buy bread that that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, 
There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? What details missing from the story? The kid's name. What's the kid's name? Do you realize that John is the only one who even acknowledges a lad being there? The other gospels don't tell us where the loaves came from, where the fish came from, just that that's what we have. This is the only passage of scripture that even tells us the lad. What was his name? Who was his family? How did he get there? We don't know. What did we know? He was faithful. You see, that's what, a, what integrity is all about. It's about anonymity. Remember in our giving, we're not supposed to let the left hand know what the right hand is doing? Why? Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We don't need to know the name. Integrity says, I'm going to do what is right regardless of whether or not anybody knows my name. Because it doesn't matter. You know, it's funny, I got to thinking about this. Some folks really get bent out of shape with this whole recognition thing. If we was to print a program, get everybody's name listed, and you accidentally missed one, here comes somebody, you missed my name. Or worse yet, you missed my child's name. Yeah, our secretary is a meanie like that. She just gets something, you know, in her crawl, and she just off with her head kind of a thing. Right, Miss Dottie? <laughs> you know, when somebody comes up and is all cranky about it, that is exactly what that's saying. You don't like them, do you? It's like, you got to be kidding. A name was missing, or it got misspelled. Woo-hoo. Some folks are really honked off about that. You know, we have been here for 27 years, and there's folks still don't know how to spell our last name. I am dead serious. They have no idea how to spell our last name. I've been here all my life. My parents have been here my whole life. Still don't know how to spell my last name. Vicky has been here for 27 years. V-I-C-K-I-E, I, or E-Y. A few of you know, okay. A lot of people have no clue. You know what? Does that bother us? No. Do we care? No. Are we offended by it? No. Not to brag, but we're smart enough to know who you're talking about. <laughs> I mean, seriously. But some folks, man, they got to have that recognition. Integrity says I don't need it. I'm just going to do what's right. The next one is acceptability. Integrity protects the gift by acceptability. You say, what do you mean by that? Go back, if you will, uh, to chapter 8, verses 22 through 24. We have sent with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you, and our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. Wherefore, show ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. All right? Titus, he says, he's been proved. Now prove yourselves. We don't like that, do we? But we have to keep proving ourselves. Not proving ourselves to each other, kind of like, well, I'm, I'm worth something. Not that kind of proving ourselves. But proving ourselves, demonstrating that we are acceptable for the Lord's service. Throughout the Scripture, Philippians chapter 2, Romans chapter 14, two passages that talk about this constant need to approve ourselves. If somebody is to take an oath of office or they are commissioned into service, here's the oath that they are going to take. They will take this oath. They will say, I do solemnly swear that I support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely without mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter, so help me God. The moment that they place their hands on that Bible and they take that oath, they have said, this is what I am going to do. 
When are they expected to prove it? Every day and in every decision that they make. Not just some, every. When are we to prove ourselves, Christians? Every day, every decision that we make is to be a decision of integrity. It must be. It has to be. Integrity protects the gift. Second thing, integrity protects the guarantee. Integrity protects the guarantee. 2 Corinthians 9. He says in verse 1, For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia. The Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that, as I said, you may be ready, lest haply if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Integrity protects the guarantee. The church had promised to give a gift. Evidently, Paul had bragged about this church and what great givers they were. And, and that provoked others to give. And now Paul, if you will, in a sense, he comes to collect their gift. He says, I want to guarantee that you're actually following through. You made a promise. Now are you going to see it through? And he says, if you don't, I will be ashamed with you. My shame will be your shame, and it's going to be our shame before all these churches that I bragged about you to. Turn your Bible to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. This is so, so very, very important. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, we have some instructions concerning vows, and we need to be very, very careful when we make vows, when we promise something. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, The Bible says, when thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools, pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldst not vow, than thou shouldst vow and not pay. You say, well, what if the vow vowed becomes an impossibility to fulfill? Or somebody realizes down the line that it would actually be a sin to fulfill it. In the book of Leviticus chapter 5, we're not going to go to that right now, but Leviticus chapter 5 gives a provision for that sort of thing. And if there is provision in the Old Testament for that, there has to be provision in the New Testament. That if we were to vow a vow and we cannot, and you know what? It's very possible. That is very possible that we could have vowed a vow and it becomes an impossibility to fulfill it. What do we do? How do we handle that? If it becomes an honest impossibility, not just because we didn't want to do it or we flaked out, that kind of thing, a true impossibility you go and you make it right. You make it right with the individual that you promised it to. You certainly make it right with God. You know, we confess our sin before God. He is faithful and just to do what? Forgive us. So if it is an impossibility, if it is something that is obviously a sin, well, we shouldn't have made the vow to begin with in the first place, right? So again, we go before the Lord and say, boy, Lord, I should never, ever have vowed that. That was a sin. But if we have vowed something and we just kind of got bored with the vow, we decided that we're uh, you know, we just kind of wanted to get lazy. And I've shared the illustration with you before. you got to be careful what you vow because God will hold you to it. I told you when I first started driving school bus that we were scared silly. Don't ever run out of fuel because of the mechanic. You'll never live it down, and he's not going to be happy with you. And I took a bus out, and it was the first time I'd had that bus, and that fuel gauge started out at a quarter of a tank, and I thought, for what I'm doing, plenty. Almost as soon as I turned it on, I heard this suction. And I watched that gauge just go. And I started praying. And I vowed to God, I says, I will never pull out under half a tank. If you'll just get me back there, I will never pull out under half a tank. I get back and I find out that the gauge was broke. Thanks for telling me that. (laughs) Had plenty in it. But I'll tell you what, I will never, and I have never, pulled out of that bus garage under half a tank. There's been times I'm looking at it, okay, oh, Lord, look, I, I, I'm, 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 I'll whisk her off, Lord, is that okay? The Lord says, what did you vow? You're right. And so my laziness has made me have to do it in the rain, do it in the snow or whatever. And I'm learning because I'll wait for the nicest, sunniest day, and if I'm on three quarters of a tank, I'm filling her up if it's nice out. <laughs> I'm going to do that again. 
Integrity protects the guarantee. If it's been promised, it should be given. The last thing is this. Integrity protects the heart of the giver. Looking in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7, the Bible says this. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. The integrity of the heart as we give. Should there not be integrity in our heart when we give back to the Lord? That integrity, what does that integrity look like? Well, the Bible says every man, according as he purposeth in his heart. That means to decide beforehand. The amount of our gift in the offering is not determined by dollars and cents. It's determined by what the heart planned to give beforehand. So what did the heart plan to give? We are told in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21 that where your treasure is, finish it out, there will your heart be also. So as he purposeth in his heart, when we give, where was our heart in the giving? Was there heart involved in our giving? You know, Christian, I think that is so important because our tithe, that's so easy to figure out, right? I mean, a tenth. How hard is it to move a decimal point? Some folks are going, I don't know how to figure that. That's real simple. Just move the decimal point. You got it figured out. Is our heart in it or is that just kind of a, you know, it's just, oh, that's what I do. Here's Here's the tithe. That's what I do. You can faithfully give your tithes and your offerings, but your heart not be in it. The Lord wants our heart in it. Can we say tonight that our giving in this Lord's day, that our heart's given the gift? The second thing is not grudgingly, the Bible says. Not grudgingly. That has to do with our attitude. Not of necessity. That means that we don't feel coerced. Cheerfully. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean we ought to tell jokes before we take up the offering, make sure everybody's laughing? You know, because we want cheerful givers. Is that what that means? That is not what that means. Let me give you an example. And this, I, I read this story. I had never heard this before. Some of you are going to say, oh, yeah, I knew that. Well, okay, great. But in 1990, there was a fellow by the name of Randy Alcorn. Randy Alcorn writes books. He's a name that's around. Randy Alcorn was the pastor of a large church that he had planted in Oregon. He loved his ministry. He loved what God had called him to do. Uh, He loved the opportunity to minister to these people. He really believed he was going to spend the rest of his life pastoring in this church. Randy Alcorn was also involved in uh, nonviolent protests at abortion clinics. It was just very peaceful protests, um, you know, going and talking to people, things like that. Randy Alcorn was arrested and he was jailed several times. Uh, Finally, two of the abortion clinics brought successful civil suits against him that totaled $8.4 million. This was a pastor who couldn't pay that. I don't know too many that could. They were going to seize the um, assets of his church. They were going to seize the assets of him personally, and he said that he could not in good conscience turn over money to a clinic that was going to murder babies. He gave up his church. He parted ways from them. He wrote all of his possessions over to his wife's name because they couldn't take that. And there was something else I did not know. They could not garnish his wages, provided his wages were minimum wage. And so he continued serving for minimum wage. He started up an organization called Eternal Perspective Ministries, and in that ministry, he made minimum wage. Finally, after something like 12 years, the time of the lawsuit had run out, and for those years, he lived and supported his family, making only minimum wage. He saw joy in giving. That's what joy is all about. It has nothing to do with, with, I can give more than this person, or boy, I can just write a humongous check kind of a thing, or all that. No. It has to do with the sacrifice that comes in the gift. And this was a man that understood what cheerful giving was all about because he realized that the stuff of life doesn't matter. He had to give away all of his stuff, if you will, 
so that an abortion clinic could not make $8.4 million and fund more murders of babies. That's cheerful giving. There's so much more in this passage, but I want to finish out with just two verses, verse 6 and verse 8. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. If we truly believe that, giving is going to be a joy. You cannot outgive God. That phrase is not cliche. That phrase is truth. You cannot outgive God. When, when you give according with integrity in your heart, according to the principles of verse 7, and you give joyfully and you give bountifully, God's going to take care of you. God is going to take care of you. There are folks through the years, they've said, we, cannot, we can't afford to give. We can't afford to give. We can't afford to tithe. Everybody can. It's whether or not everybody chooses to and whether or not they choose to trust God. God has always been faithful. There's absolutely nobody that could stand up and say God has not been faithful. God's always been faithful. Tonight, I'm not asking anybody to give more. I'm not asking that. I'm glad that that's on video. I hope whoever watches it on our website hears that. We're not asking anybody to give more. I'm asking for all of us to examine our hearts as we give. Does our heart have integrity in that gift? That's the only thing tonight I present to you, and I ask you to examine yourself. Tonight, if you're here, you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, the greatest gift ever given was Jesus Christ. And do you realize that as we're talking about being a cheerful giver, that Jesus Christ gave himself cheerfully? It says in Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God for the joy that was set before him. You mean the joy of being able to set down at the right hand of the throne of God? He was there before Calvary. You mean the joy about him being able to return? No. The joy about what Calvary was all about. Redeeming his creation. Redeeming you, me. Redeeming a lost sinner. He took Calvary to do that. And Jesus said that was a joy to shed my blood for you. Think about that. It was a joy to die for you. It was a joy to rise again for you. It is a joy to offer salvation to you. The greatest gift ever given was a gift given joyfully. Tonight, if you're here without Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's a gift you can receive this evening. Jesus, He's the one that paid it all for you. You do nothing but repent and believe the gospel. You turn from whatever it is that you've been trusting to be right with God, and you recognize that what the Bible says about you is true. You're a lost sinner on your way to an eternity in hell. And you need to be born again, and there's only one way to be born again. It's Jesus. Would you trust Him tonight? Would you give us the opportunity to open God's Word with you and introduce you to Jesus? Stand with me, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Our Heavenly Father, tonight, as believers in Christ, You have given so much to us. And Lord, it is a joy to be able to give back to you, to give in to your work, to support your ministries, to support uh, your missionaries, to support evangelism locally and globally. Father, may we just examine our hearts about it tonight to see whether or not we are giving with integrity. Lord, for that lost soul here this evening, We pray tonight would be the night of salvation. They need you. And you're working on their hearts, Lord. You're convicting their soul. May this be the night of salvation for some lost person. We pray in Jesus' name. 